Hello and welcome to Bespoke Unit. My name is Paul Anthony. I'm CP. And in today's video, we're going to be looking at how tobacco is grown and planted right here in the Dominican Republic with Davidoff Cigars. We hope you enjoy this video. Davidoff controls 15 different zones in Dominican Republic and the, each zone is a different type of soil that they have identified. And then they grab farmers from different zones and they have a contract with that farmer. So as a contracted farmer, Davidoff basically invests in you and finances you the whole operation. Sure. They finance you the fertilizers, any other product that you're gonna be using, the technical advice, they give you the 45 day old plant to transplant. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then they also even finance the curing barns. Okay. So you basically end up having uh, everything financed for you and then from your earnings you basically pay them back. Pay them back yeah. And it's a win-win situation because they get the tobacco that they want at the quality that they want and then you have a partnership with a great company that finances everything you and makes sure that you win money. With respect to the, the plant flowering, um, do you have a section of the farm that you keep to actually uh, get the uh, tobacco seed from to grow in the future? So Davidoff, what they do is, because they finance the whole operation, they also finance you the plant. They have 52 greenhouses, which we'll see later, okay. uh, where they're creating over 9 million plants every single year. <laughs> so imagine 9 million plants every single year given to each farmer, and then basically the farmer gets this 45 day uh, plant that it is hybridized by Davidoff. It's actually male sterile. So that plant, even, even if it were to grow a flower, which we don't because we eliminate the flower, um, this has no ability to create seeds. That means that nobody can steal Davidoff's seeds, uh, okay. which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And at what um, stage is the flower removed from the plant? Depending on the variety, the flower comes out at different moments. Sure. Uh, a lot of times when you see the flower come up or you let the flower come up, some people say that's where the end of the commercial leaves end. Mm. But some varieties, like for example, Piloto, Piloto, the flower comes out earlier than San Vicente. Uh, when the moment you start seeing it, you basically take it off. So normally this is remains, oh, there goes my cigar. This is remains, so normally the, if I open this up, the flower would be coming right out of here. Uh. Right there, that's where the flower is gonna start coming out. You can see it already, right? That's where the flower would be. So you eliminate it, it cr eliminates the competition uh, from the from the leaves. Because here we are in the business of leaves. We don't sure. want to see beautiful flowers. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> uh, more nutrients go to the leaf. You got a healthier leaf, a stronger leaf. Um, only in some different countries and different uh, agricultural practices, they leave the flower. A great example is in Ecuador. Connecticut shade, Connecticut seed grown in Ecuador. Um, that tobacco, they let the flower grow. That way, uh, the leaf ends up being thinner. And those tobacco plants, because you're not limiting the height, grow twice this height. So what's really cool is that tobacco has the ability to grow insanely fast. Sure. When I take you to the greenhouse, you're gonna see how small the seed is. And from dust, basically the size of dust, it grows to a plant of two kilos. Oh wow. So yeah. that's in about 105 days, more or less. Mm -hmm. And um, it grows 20 million times its original weight <laughs> in 100 days. <laughs> wow. Which is ridiculous. Pretty exponential. Yeah, so it changes really, really, really quick. Um, basically at this stage, you're, we're looking at about a 50 day old plant mm -hmm. that we transplanted on Thursday. And basically, uh, we're gonna be feeding it water slowly. Of course, we depend a little bit on weather, but we have irrigation here by, uh, by gravity. And uh, once it reaches 60 more days, so basically 45 days of greenhouse plus 60 more days, then you're gonna have a plant that is about that tall. Sure. And yeah. then we're gonna start harvesting two leaves from the bottom up every two, three days, more or less. Okay, so the harvesting starts around day 105. Yeah, more and or less. And then these uh, particular plants, they have around, you're saying 16 leaves, correct? Mm-hmm, commercial leaves. Commercial leaves. 16 okay. commercial leaves that you're actually going to be able to use for cigars. 
uh, discarding the very most bottom ones and the most top ones. Um, where we're gonna basically divide 16 leaves in uh, four different folio levels. So basically the plant uh, in most general cases gets divided into four different primings. Uh, like I was explaining with harvesting, every two leaves, every three days. So if you have a plant of 16 leaves, which in Dominican Republic makes you a happy farmer, right? It <laughs> puts money into your pocket. Uh, then you would have basically four leaves per priming. The bottom priming already harvested uh, would be the volado priming. And then you have the seco, you get into the visus, the next four leaves. And then you have uh, the ligero, the next four leaves. So you probably have here two seco, four visus and four ligero still left. And then the top, 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 which is like the corona, uh, or like top corona, um, that would get discarded. The most two bottom leaves normally get discarded as well. They're the ones that get dirty, the ones that get kicked around. Uh, normally do not have the quality or the body to make it into a cigar. The other thing that you want to eliminate is uh, any possibility of uh, side uh, suns, for example. Like for example here. This is a, a, what we call sun. Right, and basically what you do is you eliminate it to eliminate the competition from that leaf that would be commercial, right? And basically what the plant is doing is that because you eliminated its ability up here to pre produce a flower, uh, it creates a sun on the side and another flower would come out of here. Yeah, well, another set of flowers can come out of here. A tobacco plant has up to uh, 150 flowers. So it has the ability to have 150 capsules, each capsule containing over a thousand seeds. The typical cigar smoker doesn't get into the nuances of, um, hey, this cigar tastes lemony acid, or this cigar tastes uh, fruity acid, you know, like an apple. Sure. Right? And those terms is very hard for the typical cigar smoker to identify, and it's also very personal. But the typical cigar smoker, especially when they have a cigar that they are very loyal to, uh, let's say, for example, I'm smoking Davidoff number two. Davidoff number two is a very mild cigar. If I'm a religious smoker of this cigar and I smoke it every single day, I know what the strength level is of that cigar. And I know my strength level and my comfort level. So the moment that that cigar uh, t is a little stronger, or is a little lighter, yeah. I can pick it up right away. You get the nuance because that's, yeah. that's your blend. Yeah, so basically this number two is made from the bottom of the plant, 100%. Okay. You know, and uh, if for one, for a mistake, a leaf from up here would get in there, mm -hmm. and I'm talking 10% of the plant, nothing, half a leaf. Sure. I mean, I would immediately be able to pick up the strength level of that cigar. Mm -hmm. And it would be a little stronger and it would be not my cigar. It would not be loyal to me. And that's something you're obviously trying to keep consistent year to year. So, I mean, if it's a slightly um, stronger blend, uh, will you go from different parts of the plant depending on the particular growing season and how that's impacted the flavor of the, the leaf and ultimately the resulting cigar? You're completely correct. So on a sunnier year, um, that tobacco might be stronger, right? And if that tobacco is stronger, then I have to adapt the blend. The blend is not a formula of a certain percentage because if I keep those percentages over the different years and I use exactly the same percentages with the next crop that might be stronger, then it ruins my cigar. And I have to make sure to lower that percentage of that tobacco that is stronger or increase that percentage of that tobacco that is weaker. Or the other option might be instead of, you maybe use the same 20% just to say a number, sure, but bring up the level. Okay. So there's different ways to play around with it, but the most important thing is that the strength level is always the same and we're always using the s similar ingredients, the same variety, same soil, right? And similar positions of the leaf. That way it's always more or less the same cigar that you're getting. So look That's for a very consistent possible. flavor profile mm -hmm. and then the crops really dictating how the blend's coming together um, from that year. Yeah, so uh, what allows us uh, to be able to play around is that uh, we have inventory. So we have uh, over five years worth of inventory. And basically, if we have a crop that doesn't really match, we can also play around with different years and we can try to blend to that strength level or that flavor profile. And very similar to what champagne does. 
very similar to what champagne does. You know how in the wine industry, they have a, they can measure the amount of sugars inside a grape, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can, you can taste and you can see at what moment is ready to be harvested. You could technically do that in tobacco, but there's no, uh, let's call it, no gadget that tells you right there. You cannot, sure. you would have to send it to a laboratory and say, hey, it's prime. Um, but what we really do is, uh, or philosophically, we like to say that we talk the tobacco language, right? Sure. We, we can talk tobacco. It's my fourth language. <laughs> and um, basically, you have to understand the leaf. And there's three main different things that tell you when a leaf is ready to be harvested. First, you can say that uh, its color is changing or how we like to say its dress is changing. You know, when you're going to go on a voyage, hopefully make it into a Davidoff cigar, right? Yeah. You change your clothes. Uh, so these intense greens from up here, that there's a very intense green. Mm. The lower you go, you can see that the greens become less intense. They become lighter and you can start seeing some shades of yellow start to come in on the sides and in between the veins. Sure, and the leaf even feels a little different. It's a little bit more furry. Yeah, up, yeah. This, is, this, is, this is basically at, at uh, basically losing uh, its virility, its strength. Sure. And instead of pointing up, it's doing a reverence to the soil. Right. So you can start seeing that the leaves, uh, instead of being up, they, the bo most bottom ones are gonna start doing this. And, you, and then we're saying it's doing a reverence to the soil, saying thank you uh, for all the nutrients, the sunlight, the rainfall. This year, not a lot of rainfall. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and basically, uh, now it's saying thank you so it can go on its journey. And the other thing that will tell you when a leaf is ready or it's not, is that a le leaf that is ready is not going to resist. Um, it's gonna be want to be taken. Uh, where the leaves on top are gonna be very flexible. And if I try to break it, like it resists a lot. A leaf that is ready, and let me see if I find one more or less. You should be able to hear a crack. Nope. Wait, right. see that one was not really ready but you should hear a crack. And that's why, you see, it was resisting, so it's not ready. And that's what you do not do in a tobacco farm because <laughs> then they get mad at me. But basically, every two leaves, every three days, and sadly, this one was really not too ready. It was doing the reverence, but not enough. It's still too intense screen. But basically, you would hear a very loud crack. And when you send in 30 people uh, to harvest all at one time, you're just hearing clack, 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 yeah. clack, and we say it's like music. Yeah. Yeah. The rhythm of the farm. So. And the one beat rhythm of the farm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Klaus, so we're here in January, and uh, at dinner last night you were explaining that you've only had about one millimeter of rainfall um, in December, which is way below the averages. So what, what kind of average rainfall do you expect here? Uh, in this region, we're normally expecting about 60 millimeters to 80 millimeters of rainfall every month. <laughs> so, vast difference. Uh, every region di uh, differs, but uh, one millimeter of rainfall in December is not enough. We're not done with January. We've had a little bit more, but it's still very, very, very dry. Um, so, it comes down to th two things. Either you depend on God, you pray every day that it rains, <laughs> or you invest. Um, in this particular farm, we have invested, obviously. Um, we have a well um, where we can amass amounts of water, and then we can irrigate the farm. In this particular area, there's also rice grown, so uh -huh. we actually get uh, water given to this farm three times a week. So we, every, three ta every three times a week, we're able to fill up the well and make sure that we always have water for the rest of the crop. Um, and then with a pump, we basically shoot the water all the way up to the top of the farm. And then by gravity, it just irrigates all of this. Um, there's, all, there's all these channels we can see. So this isn't built here to um, kind of divert rainwater. This is purposely built for irrigation purposes. This is purposely built for irrigation purposes. You can see the tobacco plants on the top of the mounds. Uh, we move the mounds accordingly. Uh, you can also see that there's also uh, like a white powder where the tobacco is growing. Those, that's the remains of the fertilizer that we also pump into the water system. And basically we are able to irrigate and also fertilize at the same time. Um, different farms do it differently. There's a dispersion, there's also by, uh, uh, by drop system. 
Mm -hmm. um, so every farm is different. In this one, because we have a really nice incline, we are able to uh, uh, irrigate through gravity. Now what the, the yield is, that's a whole nother topic. Because uh, you could argue a very sunny year, yes, you're gonna have very thick tobacco, but in general, a very sunny year means that the flower comes out earlier. It also means that you're probably gonna get a smaller plant, right? Um, smaller plant, <laughs> not in this case, because we've invested here. But um, what happens is that you look at other farms that have not done the investment and the plants won't grow as much because they don't have water to grow. Sure. Um, but does that lack of growth, does that help the flavor profile in any way? Sunnier year, again, means a stronger uh, tobacco, more, you could say more flavorful tobacco. Uh, but uh, in regards to yield, some people might have just a very bad year because they have no rainfall at all. But if you have the investment, you're still able to get your, your tobacco plant to grow quite big. And then what's nice is because it's sunnier, the tobacco plant is thicker mm. and you sell by weight. So uh -huh. as a farmer, when you have thicker leaves, um, you might have a smaller plant, but you have a heavier leaf, so the yield doesn't vary that much. Okay. You know, as long as you don't, you have an okay year. I mean, sure. it's all up to chance, right? It's all up to weather. Um, but if, as long as you have an okay year, a drier year doesn't mean bad. Sometimes we even prefer drier year because after growing the tobacco, what we call our second crop is a curing barn. And it's 45 days that if you mess that up, you invested and you wasted all your time because you did a great effort here and then the curing barn, you messed it up. And the curing barn, the humidity has to be very stable and dry years allow us to control the humidity inside the curing barn much better. On very wet years, the humidity inside the curing barn goes up, you have to open up the doors, you have to heat up the floor, and you have to do different things to maintain the humidity stable on very wet years. Dry years is very easy to control the curing barn. But are, are there certain issues with a dry year? So with like uh, bugs or, and again with like, you know, uh, more moist years, are there different diseases or pests that, you know, favor a particular type of weather condition or are there some that kind of appear all the time? Well, some insects appear no matter what. But for sure. example, in Dominican Republic, uh, on very dry years for the last five, six years, we've been seeing uh, uh, the tomato virus show up. And this little insect that carries a tomato virus, tobacco and the tomato plant are the same family, so in the Asia plants, and basically, or nightshade plants, mm -hmm. and basically it transfers over. It, it started happening some years ago, and now on dry years, it's apparent. Rain normally washes away the insect. So what you really want is an average year in sure. rainfall. You don't want too much rainfall, because now if you have too much rainfall, then mold starts to come. Blue mold is very typical. And then that's another disease that is not apparent on dry years, which we're thankful for. But on very wet years, it's this, it could be disastrous. Sure. And then with the um, the tomato uh, virus bug, I mean, if that would to strike someone's farm, like, are they expecting a complete crop loss or partial crop loss, and can you know fumigate and mitigate some of the downsides? If you are preventive, if you're adding the right. Uh, insecticides in time uh, you can definitely prevent major loss um, we always see a one percent two percent on very dry years of uh, yield loss um, but when it first struck in the country nobody was prepared uh, the country lost over 30 percent of its total tobacco uh, production wow that's huge uh, and i mean people that were ready uh, like in this farm, we lost about 5% due to that virus. So we, we were very preemptive. We were able to act upon it, uh, but some people weren't so lucky. And when I say 30%, that's the average countrywide. Some people lost their entire crop. If you only lost 5%, then someone else has got to <laughs> yeah, lose significantly lot, more to, a bigger chunk. to make that up, you know? So. Yeah, I mean, sorry for them, but it, it's, it's something that now we have been working on for some years, and now we as a country are more prepared. So it's yeah. not the end of the world, and you yeah. just have to adapt with the times. Sure, and then at the other mm -hmm. end of the scale with the blue mold, is there any way you can mitigate that, or is it just a little bit tougher because of the, mm -hmm. the raw moisture and humidity in the air? It's a little tougher, uh, but um, basically you try to look at the plants that are infected, uh, you try to take those plants out, you try to basically- You'll, you'll take the whole plant uh, yeah, away. I mean, yeah, you, I see tomato virus, or I see a plant that is infected with something, rip that whole thing out. 
Gone. and make sure it doesn't spread to anywhere else. And then I try to make sure that uh, water is not uh, settling anywhere uh, because water settling in some part of the farm can be disastrous because that can be a great breeding area for blue mold. Sure. Um, and then blue mold is also something that happens per country. Some countries doesn't even get that. And then varieties also have to be planted accordingly. Mm -hmm. So we know that certain varieties are stronger against blue mold than others. So we know that some areas are more prone to getting blue mold because it has more rainfall. Then we plant varieties that are stronger against that. So we also plant varieties not only to flavor, but also to resistance to diseases. You have very dry years like this year. You have very wet years like three years ago. I think it rained nonstop for the whole month of November, December, and January. Sure. So you, you have it's very cycles, and then you have years right in the middle. Um, we always plan after hurricane season in Dominican Republic, so that's out of the question. Because always people ask me, what sure. about hurricanes that hit Dominican Republic? We always plan after. Um, and then what allows us is also in farms like this is because we plant in stages we're able to uh, basically split, spread out the risk. Mm -hmm. So not the whole farm is getting flooded on or not the whole farm is getting just dry. So we're hoping that that third stage that we just started last week, so uh, is get that, some is it three total stages you're doing then? In this farm. And then how yeah. spread out are those stages? 20 to 30 days. Okay, so you're gonna get less. kind of a month between. Yeah, you try to give farm. about a month and that way you basically, one month might have been dry, but hopefully the next month rains, rains so a little more. Like, like three years ago, you had a lot of rain. This year, you're very dry, so mm. it seems. Last year was a very even year. Well, very good, so. Yeah. Yeah, so is it like a third, third, third almost? Or I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously here we can see mature plants and here we have the baby tobacco. And earlier on, you were talking about how you know, certain areas of the farm are, are laid to rest. And what's the kind of the cycle and percentage of land that you're, you're resting um, each year? In diff and every farm is a little different, but in this particular farm, uh, we're letting one third of the whole farm rest. Okay. So uh, every couple of years, uh, we rotate the land and we have about one third of the farm resting. Uh, the other two thirds in this particular farm, we are growing in uh, different stages. So what you see right here is the first stage uh, over yonder, over over there, we have another tobacco that's about this height. And then this would be our third stage. Sure. What this allows us to do is basically that uh, instead of putting all of our eggs in one basket, sure. uh, we, we are depending on weather, obviously, right? And we're, it could, something could happen, a natural disaster, you never know. Sure. Uh, we basically, um, uh, put out an average and say, okay, every more or less 20 to 30 days, we'll start a new stage. Mm -hmm. And that way uh, we can get an average of what the weather was that year. Sure. And some stages maybe will perform better than others, but if there's one particular week that was very rainy, the mm -hmm. other stages are going to avoid it. Avoid it, okay. Yeah, so it's- So it isn't like a typical, like the first planting is always the best. It really is out external factors. And as you say, you're kind of hedging your bets based on the external factors you can't control. But really, we kind of just go out there and we just uh, do it on a day-to-day -day basis. I suppose whatever you're dealt with, you got to deal with yeah. regardless. I mean, percentages mm -hmm. are all good, but mm -hmm. you know, if it's not raining or it is raining, then it doesn't matter what the percentages say, you got to yeah. just deal with it, you know? I mean, all the all the averages what really do is like they help you better prepare for next year. So you basically- So whatever uh, particular cigars selling well that you'll know to, yeah. Well, you know, was it yes, like how, we can when, think when that far ahead, but, but I'm thinking preparing more in uh, amounts of fertilizer I'm going to be okay. buying, amounts of insecticides I'm going to be buying. So I have averages of, of my yearly consumptions, you know, and I have averages of, of how much uh, money I'm spending even on gas, you know, mm -hmm. to transport things. So uh, sure. all these averages are just things that help me prepare for the next year, for the next crop so I can have a ballpark number of I know how much money I'm spending every single week. Because mm -hmm. this is basically a week to week operation. Sure. That's how we're handling this farm. What ends up happening later on is that basically uh, as a farmer and then Davidoff in multiple times, they will be uh, checking the quality. At this moment, it's not really about the flavor. The flavor pretty much is gonna be the same because sure. the same farm but the quality in regards to the structure of the leaf, how many breakages it has, if it had any disease or any dots or anything. Um, basically all that will be discarded as a C quality, you know, and then the really healthy ones will be the A quality. And then the really healthy ones will be going into the premium cigars. Sure. And then uh, the other tiers will be filtering in, into 
um, bundle cigars, uh, second tier brands and different things like that. Okay. How many staff do you have on this farm? This farm on high season, meaning that you are uh, planting tobacco last week. I had also people harvesting here. Then I also had people putting tobacco inside the curing barn. Uh, top, it's about 50 people. Yeah, 50 people. Yeah, and then this is about a 25 acre farm. 25 acres. Or okay. that's uh, uh, 10 hectares. 10 hectares. That's 10 hectares, 160 tareas here in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> <laughs> and then when people are actually, you know, harvesting the leaves, how are they bringing them? Are they working in teams? Are they, you know, they're getting two leaves each uh, prime in? Um, are they taking them, you know, how, how, how does that process work? Yeah, so basically uh, have different uh, employees walk through. And they're harvesting two leaves when they're ready. And then at every two leaves, um, basically, <laughs> I'm laughing at you because you just broke one of my leaves. Did I? Yeah. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh, but um, basically, a leaf that is harvestable and not broken, um, <laughs> basically gets harvested and uh, we put it these into these hand carts where two people basically, they start piling them up and then they put them in the hand cart and they take them into the curing barn and then there's ladies and they're ready to sew them on, okay. on the spot. We basically make sure that every single priming is separated uh, by different sections of the curing barn sure. as it comes in, but also we have a very simple way of uh, changing the, or basically identifying each uh, folio level by just a string. So the string color basically tells you it's from the bottom of the plant or from the top of the plant or the middle sure. of the plant. What's an easy way to keep yeah. track? You know? What we do at the end is that as a farmer, you come in with your agronomer, your supervisor, and you sort every single leaf that's been curing inside the curing barn for 45 days. Mm -hmm. And then you make sure that it's the right one, that it's the same uh, density, the same strength, by just looking at it and feeling it. And then you sort it uh, according to quality, A, B, C. And then basically, once as a farmer, you transfer over the, the tobacco to the Davida factory, then they purchase you the tobacco at the depending quality. Okay, great. Well, Charles Philippe and I really hope you enjoyed that video. Please also check out the full length documentary of how Davidoff makes cigars. And down here, there's a full playlist of our whole Dominican experience.